said, we are back with another Tank Talk. This week, we're going to be covering metazoan parasites of ornamental fish. Um, we have with us Dr. Nick St. Ern, who is a certified aquatic veterinarian. Um, you can see some of his credentials right there, too. Um, so thank you once again, Dr. Nick, for joining us and obviously for putting together this information. Um, it's always really, uh, really interesting uh, facts that you bring forward. So um, I guess without further ado, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Ian. Uh, glad to be here again. So our last presentation was about protozoa and we're protozoan parasites. And we're going to go ahead and tell you about the parasites that are bigger than protozoa. So we call those metazoa. Protozoa means uh, first life. They're the single-celled organisms. Metazoan is like the next stage life, which is multi-celled organisms. And so the, today we'll talk about parasitic worms and crustacea. So the most common metazoan parasites include monogenean trematodes, such as dactylogyrus and gyrodactylus, which we commonly see in freshwater aquarium fish. And there are also different species that we'll see in marine fish as well. The digenean trematodes, which are embedded inside of this fish, these are both flatworms. And then we talk about tapeworms, nematodes, uh, segmented worms like annelids, which uh, you think about earthworms are a segmented worm. The earthworms are food, they're not parasites for fish, but there are other species of annelid, annelid worms that are parasites like the leeches. And then different crustacea. Now, we, when we normally think of crustacea, we talk about crabs and lobsters, but there's miniature versions of these that are actually fish parasites. And so we're going to touch on many of these today. So let's start with the flatworms, uh, the trematodes. So platyhelminthes means flat worm. And the members of this phylum are flattened, soft-bodied invertebrates ranging in size from microscopic. And most of the fish parasites are microscopic. You really can't see them with your naked eye unless you have either really good eyesight or maybe a magnifying glass. And of course, we usually diagnose it using a microscope. And, but some of them get up to 50 feet long, 15 meters, which is like incredibly big to think about some kind of a worm that's that long. Uh, fortunately, those are not the parasite, parasitic ones, although some tapeworms can get quite large as well. Uh, so the monogenean uh, the mono means one, genia comes from generation, like genetics, and it's a life cycle on one host. And that's not entirely true because sometimes they can go from host to host, but the, the life cycle is can be completed on one host. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're only on one host their entire life, but the, the single host is all they need to reproduce. The digenean trematodes, mean die meaning two, two genetics, two generations. It actually takes multiple hosts for them to reproduce. And they usually start, <clears throat> we'll start, let's say, with the adult inside of a bird or a mammal. The eggs are passed out in the feces, get into the water. The, the eggs hatch into uh, uh, metasacaria or sacaria that'll get inside of a worm or a snail, depends on what species it is. Those will then be eaten by the fish. The fish acts as an intermediate host. So it's not the host that the parasite multiplies and reproduces in, it just acts as an intermediate host. And then the bird or the mammal will eat the fish and the life cycle goes on. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to those slides. So specifically, I'm only going to talk about these two monogenean trematodes because they're the most commonly seen ones, and they're both very, very problematic, very commonly found. <clears throat> so dactylogyrus, meaning finger that wiggles, and gyrodactylus, meaning wiggly finger. So they're, they're just, whoever named these things had, must have had a sense of humor. And they knew one's dactylogyrus, the other's gyrodactylus. And so can you tell the difference between them? Yes, and we'll get to that. Uh, but pretty much they look like wiggly fingers under the microscope. And so what is it? So the one of them is, we call it a gill fluke. It can sometimes be found on the body, but predominantly on the gills. The other one we call the skin fluke because it's predominantly found on the skin and the fins, but occasionally found on the gills. And by, by far and large, they actually do have a site preference to the gills and the skin, but not 100%. Okay, so the gill flukes, they primarily live on the tips of the gills, 
sometimes the skin. They definitely cause gill filament hyperplasia, uh, where the gills get thickened and get a lot of white blood cells and epithelial cells built up on them, which reduces the ability of the gills to work. So they end up with hypoxia or, or uh, poor breathing, uh, low oxygen. <clears throat> And so you might see those fish breathing rapidly, their gills will be opening and closing very rapidly, but sometimes you might not even see that until suddenly the fish dies. Uh, so if you do a gill tip biopsy and look at it in the microscope, you will see these. And the interesting thing is these reproduce by laying eggs. Okay, then the gyrodactylus, they're primarily on the skin and fins, but occasionally you'll see them on the gills. These are not egg laying, but hermaphroditic, meaning there's a, there's two organisms that are both, each one is a male and a female, they get together and mate, then both of them go off and have babies. So it kind of doubles your reproductive rate because every individual is both a male and a female, but they do have to mate. But once they mate, both go off and have babies. And they only give birth to one baby at a time. And the embryo with the hooks is often visible inside of the adult, and we'll show you pictures of that. And then the young attach usually just attached right next to the adults, uh, and they're almost full grown when they're born. So they're essentially, they are adults when they're born. Uh, so here's just showing some reproductive. This is the dactylogyrus, which is the gill fluke. This is a gill here. It's attached to the gill with these hooks. So you can see both species on the end have, there's 14 little tiny hooks around here, and then there's two giant hooks in the middle, and they're like grappling hooks that they just embed into the tissue. Now we've talked about how parasites can cause tissue damage, which then get bacterial infections that occur in that damaged tissue. So this is a big problem with these flukes is just like some of the protozoa, the bacteria can be what you notice is a bacterial infection. But the reason your fish gets a bacterial infection is because these uh, parasites are damaging the, either the gills or damaging the skin with these giant hooks and um, the bacteria get inside there. So this particular one, we're only seeing part of it in this slide, but I, I have this picture to show an egg. This egg was just laid, and I actually have a video of this a parasite laying the egg, but I didn't have the video on this slide, uh, so just a photo. This one is a skin fluke, and they look very much similar when you look at it, but the difference is here inside of this, this is the baby. And when you see this pair of hooks right here, you'll see these hooks. This is the hook of the baby inside of the adult. And this baby is curled in half. So it goes from here is the opisthahapter, which is the part that has the hooks, it goes down here, it bends and comes back up. So if you look how long this is from here to here, but it's doubled over, if you were to stretch that out, that's gonna be as long as this adult. When it comes out this little hole right here, this baby is gonna come out and it's gonna be as big as the adult. So not only do you have Two, two parents both having babies, but the babies have the babies are born as adults. Now, the other thing is occasionally you'll see inside of this one that's ready to be born, you'll see another set of hooks in its middle because this baby can be born already pregnant. Hmm. So the baby can pop out and already have a baby growing inside of it. So that's kind of weird. Kind of wild. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is just a close up of the hooks just to show you what they look like. Both species have, or most species have similar hooks. Some species actually have multiple sets of hooks. Okay, so here we're talking specifically about the skin fluke. And I wanted to put this picture on here because first of all, here we're looking at a piece of, of fin tissue. So this is a, a fin off of a koi. You see this is the cartilage. It kind of looks like bamboo. That's normal uh, cartilage shape. Their black is uh, spots or pigment cells, the orange pot spots or pigment cells. Uh, so here's another piece of fin, it's got more black than orange on it. Uh, this is an air bubble, and this is a skin fluke, and it's attached by with its hooks right here. And they wiggle around like a little wiggly finger. So you can see it's kind of curled right here, but it'll straighten out, and they stretch out, and they contract. Uh, on this one, this is a piece of gill tissue. And I can tell it's gilled because it has the lamellae here, but this is not a healthy looking gill because there should be a gap 
between each of these red little lines, there should be a gap and there's not. This gap is getting filled in by extra cells because of irritation. And then, so we said, well, this is a gill fluke, but I can look right here and I see it has actually a baby inside of it. So I know it's a skin fluke and it just happens to be on the gill. So here's a skin fluke on the skin, but here's a skin fluke on the gill. And now we'll look at a gill fluke. And here is the gill fluke, so dactylogyrus, and this is again a piece of gill tissue. Uh, the spotted area, this line, is the cartilage inside of the gill filament. These are the gill lamellae. In a healthy fish, there would be a gap between each of these lamellae. In this case, they're, they're getting filled in with extra tissue. There's also this layer of extra tissue being built on the top, and that's all from irritation from these parasites. Uh, now, this is got the hooks down here that's attached to the gill. This end has the mouth, so it feeds through this end. It hooks, attaches through this end. But the mouth actually acts as a sucker as well. And they can move like an inchworm between the hooks and the mouth sucker. And they, they can move along the tissue. Uh, and the one thing I wanted to point out on this, there's actually some spots right there. Those are eye spots. They're not eyeballs, but they're photosensitive because this parasite, it has an egg, which we showed you a picture of an egg. And here's a little more clear picture of an egg. The egg has a hook on it. That hook may be designed to help it attach to the gills so that the egg hatches still in the gills, but it can also fall off the fish and land on a plant and get attached to a plant, for example. And then you could buy a plant and this parasite egg could be on the plant and bring it home to your aquarium. Once this egg hatches, the myricidium that comes out, this is one right here. So this is a baby. This is an adult. This is a freshly hatched one. And even on the little baby, you can see the eye spots because they have to be able to swim from the hatched egg to the fish. And they use that eye spot to note the shadows of the fish going around and they'll swim towards those shadows. And also as they're swimming around, the fish's mouth is opening and closing. It's sucking in water. The water goes across the gills. It sucks these little babies in its mouth and then they attach to the gills as they go through. So once they're attached, uh, so here's some gills right here. Here's the hook end and this is the head end. And you can see the, the adult has four eye spots. The other interesting thing between this is there's one, two, three, four little finger-like protrusions on the head part of the gill fluke. There's only two protrusions on the skin fluke. So if you're looking at the microscope, you see these things, you look for eye spots, you look for embryo, and you look for the number of fingers at the tip of the head to determine if it's a gill fluke or skin fluke, as well as its location. Um, we'll, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to get rid of these, but I just wanted to identify them so you know what, what you would find. And these, again, are very, very common. Now, another, those are trematodes. So trematode is, is the flatworms, platyhelminthes. This is another type of trematode, but we mentioned earlier the Digenean trematode has multiple hosts in its life cycle. So the primary host uh, that they reproduce in will be either a bird or a mammal that eats the fish. They'll pass the eggs out into the water and then the larva will hatch either into a snail or a, a, a tubifex worm or some other type of, of worm that then is eaten by the fish. Once the fish eats it, it gets into the fish and then it forms a cyst. So these are gills. You see the little gill filaments here. This is a cyst, here's a cyst. This one is actually a muscle embedded in the fish. And you can see these are a little more developed. They actually look like kind of a worm-like look, looking organism already. And this is just a higher magnification. Here's the gill. This is the cartilage that's down the inside of the gill. This is the lamella. And you see this dark red, that's not normal tissue. That's abnormal on the gill. And then here's an insisted uh, uh, metasecaria of the Diogenian trematode. Now, if your fish has one of these, it's not gonna hurt it. It's not gonna be a big deal. But a lot of times what you'll see is this, where you have many, many, many of these. And especially if they're in the gill, they can damage the gills. It can cause the breathing problem. Uh, and and it, it can be very harmful for the fish if there's lots of these. They can also get into internal organs as well as gills and the skin and the muscles. And this picture is just showing, here's a, a fin of a fish 
And each of these little black grubs or black spots is a grub. This is another embedded metacercaria. And sometimes these will be yellow, sometimes they'll be white. In this particular case, they're black. Just depends on how the fish reacts to it. But these are alive and they're just sitting there in the fish waiting for this fish to be eaten so that then they can hatch out of the fish in the digestive tract of the bird or the mammal, and then they mature to the adult stage in the mammal. So if you start seeing these on your fish, they are treatable, and in small numbers, they don't really hurt the fish, but in large numbers, they can be a problem. But we, we'll talk about treating those too. <clears throat> okay, so that's the flatworms. The tapeworms are a flatworm, but they have segments in. So if you look at this little segment, right, or this tapeworm right here, it has these many little segments. Each one of these is called a proglottid, and each one of these is a reproductive organ, or contains a reproductive organ. So they can continue to reproduce, uh, and even if they break apart, the parts that pass out can be for example, eaten by another fish, or in this diagram right here, it can be eaten by a person. If you eat a fish that is that has these and you don't fully cook the fish, the people can get it. And in some countries where uh, raw fish are consumed on a regular basis, tapeworms are a major problem. I would like to put a disclaimer on sushi because I actually had sushi last night for dinner. It's one of my favorite things to eat. A good sushi restaurant, or the appropriate one, is all the sushi is flash frozen. So all that fish is frozen to kill any parasites in it. Then it's defrosted and kept at, uh, you know, like about 32 to 34 degrees. So it's not frozen anymore, but a very cold temperature. And the freezing process will kill the parasite. So if you are a sushi aficionado, uh, assuming you have a really good sushi restaurant, all your fish should actually be safe. Okay, but if you like are getting smoked salmon and you don't fully smoke it, so it's not totally smoked and, and dehydrated, that smoked salmon is probably a greater risk of getting parasites than sushi is. Uh, so these can be, there's various species of tapeworms. Uh, the common fish one, it looks like this. Uh, they can get up to three to seven feet in maturity. Uh, and even getting as big as 30 feet long. And I do know of people who have had these and will they don't even know they have it until they start passing the tapeworm with their stool. And mm -hmm. it can be several feet long coming out as you're going to the bathroom, which wow. is pretty dis disconcerting. Uh, if you, you know, you're, you're, you're all of a sudden you feel something hanging out and it's a tapeworm. So that can be a problem. And they do reproduce very rapidly. Again, these have multiple stages. If you look, there's a little uh, copepod parasite or a copepod crustacean that it that becomes gets into. The fish will then eat that, and then the mammal or other species will then eat the fish, and then the life cycle is repeated. So cook your fish or make sure it's flash frozen. Uh, fortunately, tapeworms are not very common in farm raised fish because they don't typically have the full life cycle capacity. If it's out where there's birds and other wildlife and other animals in the, the pond, they can get tapeworms. But most of the time, the, the, the birds or the mammal host is eliminated from the access to the pond. And hopefully any of these uh, other larval uh, forms are eliminated. So the fish, I don't see this very common in fish, but I've seen it in koi occasionally. Okay, roundworms, more worms. We like these worms. So there's a lot of roundworms. It's one of the most abundant animals on earth are the various species of roundworms. And the majority of these are not parasitic. Uh, they're, they live in the soil, they live in plants. Uh, they can be parasites in fish, they can be parasites in people. So you think of hookworms, whipworms, tape, well, not tapeworms, but hookworms and whipworms. Uh, your dog will get those, your dog, your cat, and even people can occasionally get, you know, your, the pets, hookworms and whipworms. So those are types of roundworms. And uh, these get into the intestinal tract and they live in the intestines. So there are lots of species that are not parasitic. And even in your aquarium, there's probably roundworms that are not parasitic living in the gravel in your, or even in the filter media in your aquarium that they eat the debris and they're not parasites. But there are some that become parasitic, and some of them are used for fish food. So, so red wigglers, uh, bloodworms. We think about vinegar eels. These are all nematodes or roundworms that are grown to feed the fish, and um, 
So they are beneficial as well. But there's a couple that are not helpful, uh, um, part, that are a couple that are harmful. This is a nematode on the scale of a fish that we, we're doing a necropsy on. So here you can see the scale, the little orange spots or the pigments. And right here is the worm. And this is a video. So I'm going to turn this on and you'll see the little worm wiggling right there. So this worm that's wiggling is on the surface of the fish that's dead. This is probably a non-parasitic nematode little worm that was living in the aquarium. The fish died. And now that you got dead fish on the bottom of the tank, anything that's in the tank is going to start growing. You know, bacteria, fungus, worms, uh, non-parasitic protozoa, they'll all show up on this fish. So this, this is just an example. It's just because this nematode was on this skin scrape on a dead fish doesn't necessarily mean it was a parasite. Now, however, if we do a, uh, uh, do a fecal sample and we see all of these little black dots are actually eggs from the nematodes. And here's, here's some of the nematodes right here. So you could do a fecal sample, look at it under the microscope. You might see something like this. Or if you do a necropsy, here's inside uh, of the intestines. Here's, here's one of these capillaria. Capillaria means little hair because they look like long, skinny hairs. And these right here, each of these little dots inside of this, these are the eggs. So you can see how many eggs are in this one worm. And then if you have lots and lots of the, these worms inside the intestines, which is possible, then you can see how many eggs they can pass. So these can be very, very problematic. And so here's another one right here. It's kind of curled around. And this I, reason I put this in here is this is the intestinal tract. So this is a necropsy. We took a piece of intestines, uh, put it on a slide, looked at it, and there was quite a few of these nematodes inside of the intestinal tract. So these are the normal layers of the intestines. And then this is the nematode in here. And then you'll see either, you know, sometimes the eggs will be loose, like in this case, or you may not see the eggs, but you might see them inside the worm. Uh, so that's something. So, what do you? How do you know if it, if it, if your fish has these intestinal worms? Uh, sometimes you won't know at all, and the fish is fine. That's great. But sometimes they'll get bloating. They might have a yellowy stool, uh, which we see the same thing with protozoa sometimes causing that. Uh, a soft stool that, that that just doesn't form like the nice brown little linear poop that the fish will normally pass. Uh, so, if you start seeing either bloating abdomen, losing weight. Uh, uh, even though they have a fat belly, the fish is starting to look skin, losing muscle mass, and having unusual diarrhea, or, or not diarrhea, but unusual stool, you might suspect some of these intestinal worms. <clears throat> and this is another one, Camelanus, which is a, a great uh, name for a worm. It's because it comes out of the anus. It's, I don't know if it's like a camel's coming out of the anus, but if you look at this, <laughs> here, this is a ram cichlid, and look at this red thing right here. This oh, worm yeah. is is dangling out of the fish, and it's actually doing that in order to pass eggs out into the fish. The, the worm is not coming out of the fish. It's just dangling part mm. of its body out. And if you were to like net this fish up, this worm will zip right back inside the fish and disappear. So if you ever look at your fish and you think, oh, he's taking a poop, but the poop is red, and not brown, and especially if it suddenly disappears going back in the fish, it may be this uh, Camelanus worm, which is a very red worm. And it looks, uh, I've seen it described as like a barber pole because it has this kind of red wiggly stripe in it, but it's it's a definitely a long, skinny, reddish worm that lives in the mm -hmm. intestines, but can protrude out through the uh, the vent or the anus of the fish very frequently seen in live bearers. So that's one thing to consider, uh, but it can occur in other species of fish. And they get it by ingesting either dead fish that have it, or they can ingest food particles, uh, uh, or looking for food particles on the bottom of the aquarium and picking up eggs uh, are ways that the fish can ingest it and then get them inside them. Okay, now we're gonna go to another kind of a flattish worm, but is an annelid worm. Annelid means ringed. And so along their body, they have little segments. And so like an earthworm, these have little linear segments on their body. And uh, not all leeches are 
parasitic. There are some that live in the environment that they can live on the plants. They live in the detritus. Uh, sometimes you'll find these little leeches in a filter. They could be parasitic, but there are, are some species that don't live on fish, only in the debris or the gravel. Uh, so that's something to consider. If they do get on the fish, if they're the parasitic kind, they can suck quite a bit of blood, which can reduce, produce anemia, which is uh, low red blood cells. And they can also spread parasites from one fish to the other because they, they'll feed on the fish, then they swim away. They actually are very good swimming worms. They'll swim away, go lay some eggs in the plant, then they'll go back on another fish and feed again. And so they, they lay eggs in the pond. These egg sacs will be attached to the surface of the pond or the aquarium or plants. And sometimes you'll see these little uh, brown to, to dark, uh, little small disks attached to things that are actually the egg sacs of these leeches. And then they have a mouth at one end and a suction cup at the other. Uh, both, both ends have suction cups. The mouth is in one suction cup and the anus is in the other suction cup. So here's a little, this is a very young larval one, a very small one, it's kind of not stretched out. Here is one that is more stretched out. This is a bigger one. This one is about two inches long. And this is a video, we'll just kind of watch it, see how it crawls like an inchworm. It actually will pull the two pieces together, switch the suction, push itself forward and then pull itself ahead. So just like creeping along like an inchworm, um, these guys will move and they can move on the fish that way. They can swim through the water pretty easily. And uh, then they'll, once they attach, then they just uh, start sucking on the fish's blood, which again, we mentioned biting into the fish and sucking blood also causes sores, which then can get bacteria or fungal infections. <laughs> Okay, so that's the end of the worm part. Those are the main worms. And there's many different species of each of those worms and there's saltwater varieties and freshwater varieties. So we just kind of gave you an idea of what those worms look like. Uh, now we're gonna talk about crustacea, which are like, you know, crabs and shrimp. And the first one is a worm. So it's not really a worm. <laughs> the reason it's called anchor worm is because if you look at it on this fish, here's a goldfish, it's attached to the skin of the fish. It looks like a worm. Um, and so I, that's where the worm part comes from. So where does the anchor come? Well, here is the worm taken out of the fish. And this portion actually has four prongs. So it's like an X shape. And those prongs are embedded under the skin like an anchor to hold the, the worm onto the fish. So once this, uh, this worm attaches to the fish, it normally does not come off. These, these anchors are deeply embedded into the, under the skin, into the muscle, and this worm will be permanently attached to the fish for the rest of its life. Now, this is a female that attaches. The male is much smaller. The male will attach to the female. It'll mate and then die. And then the female will produce two egg sacs. And if you look at the end here, this has the two egg sacs. This one, the egg sacs are gone. It has produced the egg sacs. It releases those egg sacs into the water. So now you have this sac that can contain as many as 200 eggs. Those eggs will hatch in about two weeks, depending on water temperature. The little larvae will swim around in the aquarium. Uh, the females will attach to a fish, burrow their head in, and then grow into this elongated worm shape. The males will swim around, find a female, attach to the female, do their thing, and then off they go. Uh, so only the females attach onto the fish. But you can see, in many cases, hundreds of these on fish. If you have, you know, like an aquarium where there aren't a lot of fish and you got one of these that's reproduced and you got 200 babies swimming around attaching to the fish, they can get pretty heavily infested, infested on the fish. So you can pull these off. You have to be just very careful at making sure you get this head portion off the fish. So use a pair of tweezers close to the skin, pull them off. And then I like to use a disinfectant on the skin like betadine or some type of disinfectant. Uh, and again, as we mentioned, these cause reddened sores, which may become infected with bacteria or fungal infections. And so I think we got the next one is also, this one is more crab-like. 
And uh, here again, another goldfish. This one is a koi. So this is a very giant koi. It's a very big one. All we're looking at here is the edge of the gill cover, so the operculum. So you can see here's the bony part. Here's the soft part. So the head's up here, the tail's down at the other end. And here's one that's sitting on, on the uh, gill cover of a koi. This is a goldfish. And see, this goldfish is probably three inches in, di in length approximately three to four inches maybe and you can see here so these are pretty big this is about a centimeter in diameter so about three quarters of an inch and so they're pretty large you can easily see these and when they first attach they might be very small and then they gradually grow into this larger size and these can move around on the fish so you might see them crawling around on the surface of the fish uh, and they will get on the fish they'll feed on the fish they'll swim off the fish go lay eggs mate, lay eggs, then they swim back onto the fish. So they get off and on the fish and they lay their eggs in little white strips of eggs on uh, sticks or the side of the aquarium, plants, things that are at usually near the surface of the water. And uh, there, there's been some tests where they'll put a bunch of little sticks in the water and the parasites will come and lay their eggs on the sticks, and then you pull the sticks out, throw them away, put some new sticks in. And if you're doing that on a frequent basis, you're actually uh, collecting the eggs and discarding them before they have a chance to hatch, which is a technique some places have put into like smaller ponds to try to eliminate the breeding. Um, the eggs will hatch again in two to eight weeks. So the warmer the water, the faster they hatch, cooler the water, longer it takes. The larvae that come out will attach to a fish. If they can't get on a fish in about three days, they're going to die. So there is a limited time that they have to get on the fish and start eating before, you know, otherwise they'll starve. But once they're on the fish, they get a good meal and then they'll mate and they go off and lay more eggs. And they do cause these red sores. Now, this next slide I want to show you, this is what they look like under the microscope. And... <clears throat> running down the middle here, you can't actually see it, but it runs right here, is a little needle and the needle folds flat and then they stick it out. And that needle will then work like a jackhammer on the surface of the fish. And so they'll uh, poke the skin of the fish, penetrate through even through scales, and then they just start sucking the blood. So here's some eyes. These are suction cups and that's how they can attach to the fish. The stylet is here, which is the little needle. And so they have two prominent eyes, two sucking discs, a stylet, mouth part. It pokes through the skin, releases a toxin. Uh, and, and then that will cause uh, damage to the, the tissue, which is then what the fish feed on. And they can crawl around. So not only do they make a hole, but then they can crawl somewhere else and make another hole and then crawl somewhere else and make another hole. So they can be very damaging to the fish. And you should be able to see these on the fish. But if it's if it's like a real dark fish, you might not easily identify it. If it's a light colored fish, they show up. They're sort of a grayish, greenish, olive tan color, something along that range. And then they have all these legs, just like, you know, crab. They got the, all the legs here, they attach with, they swim with these. And so they are, they are very good swimmers and they will swim around from fish to fish or, or off the fish to lay eggs. Okay, so that's the main group of most common parasites in this category you're gonna see. So how do you treat them? Well, the first thing is you have to identify it. And because a lot of these little worms especially are not easy, easily seen, you need to do a microscopic exam, which, uh, you know, a fish biologist or your uh, aquatic veterinarian can do that. If you're not able to do it yourself, they'll take fin samples, gill samples, and uh, uh, skin mucus samples. All of these can be done under anesthetic without harming the fish. If the fish is dead, you can get really good samples off of it, but only if the fish has been dead for, you know, a few hours. If it's been dead for more than a day, it's not likely going to be of, of much value to take a look at it. So they need to be freshly dead or sick, or even, you know, you could have healthy fish and do a biopsy on them and find some of these parasites. Because we've mentioned in previous talks, parasites, if everything else is going well, good aquarium water, good nutrition, the fish aren't being stressed unduly, those parasites might not be causing any obvious damage to your fish. 
Uh, if there's poor water quality, there'll be a lot more parasites, there'll be a lot more bacteria, there'll be a lot more fungus, so those fish could get infected more easily with bad water quality, or if the fish nutrition isn't set up properly, the fish is, is their immune system won't be as healthy. So that's when we'll start seeing problems occur. Uh, but fish can have parasites without having any problems. So you have to identify them because each one may require different medications. And the way you treat them is typically adding medicine to the water. It's best to do this in a hospital tank or a quarantine tank rather than trying to treat your main aquarium. But if the parasites are in your whole aquarium, you might have to treat it because you, even if you just pull out some fish, the other fish might be infected and you might not know it. Uh, there are bath treatments uh, or a dip treatments where you're just putting the fish in a, a what's called a medicated dip for anywhere from 15 minutes up to maybe an hour, or the bath where you're putting the medicine in the aquarium and the medicine just stays there. <clears throat> if you get new fish, it's always good to do a quarantine and then do a, a, a bath treatment on the quarantine tank before you put the fish into your main aquarium. And uh, some of these worms, like the intestinal parasites, tapeworms and uh, the uh, camelanus and capillaria, uh, need to be treated with uh, medication in the food. And even the grubs, so we talked about the digenean trematodes, you could give them a medicated food that will kill those inside the fish and, and get rid of those. So that can be done for those, uh, the insistent grubs of the digenean trematodes. And then it might take multiple treatments like every week or every two weeks for a period of time to get rid of them completely. Because we talked about some of these are egg layers and those eggs might take a couple of weeks to hatch and you got to treat long enough so that all the eggs hatch. So what chemicals are you using? Well, there's a couple different ones. Uh, for most of the monogenean flukes, you can use Praziquantel. So there's uh, products available Prozipon, Prozipro, other things that have Praziquantel in them. That works really good for some of these monogenean parasites. Uh, Minfin, uh, I, I like using Minfin. It's a drug that I've used a lot. It contains hydrogen peroxide and peracetic acid. And it can also, it's good for protozoa, but it's also good for some of these flukes. Um, like Praziquantel won't treat protozoa and the protozoa treatments usually won't treat flukes. So that's why you have to have different drugs for different problems. This one does treat a, a broader spectrum of different parasites. So that's kind of a good thing to use. And then you need to check the fish after treatment to make sure all the parasites are gone. And then usually you'll treat it once a week or once every other week, depending on water temperature. So cooler temperature, you treat it maybe less frequently for a longer period. Warmer water temperatures, such as an indoor aquarium, you might treat it every week for two to three weeks. Outdoor koi pond, you might treat it every two weeks for, for again, like three to four treatments. So you might be treating it for over a month. Uh, so the tapeworms are also treated with praziquantel, which we use for the flukes. Uh, and this has to be fed in the food, though, uh, rather than you can use the praziquantel in the water to treat the gill flukes and the skin flukes. But in order to get inside the fish, you need to treat it in the food. So that's where you, for the embedded digenean trematodes or uh, tapeworms inside the intestines, uh, you can either treat it in the food or you can give an intramuscular injection so it gets inside the body. When you put medicine directly in the water, uh, it doesn't go inside the fish. There are a few things that are absorbed through the gills, but the majority of medicines that are in the water don't get inside the fish. They're just on the outside of the fish. So that's why praziquantel will work for gill flukes and skin flukes, which are on the outside, but it doesn't work in the water for uh, embedded flukes or the tapeworms. But if you give it either as an intramuscular injection or in the food, it'll help. And uh, then if you also, if you know it has a life stage that lives in either a worm, a snail, or other crustacean, or birds, or other animals who we talked about, you know, if you're raising fish in an outdoor pond, you have to be more careful in trying to limit all these other animals so that it doesn't get the complete life cycle for both the digenean flukes and the tapeworms that require multiple hosts for their life cycle. So nematodes, the roundworms, those are intestinal. So again, you got to get something inside of them. So usually we use a food that contains fenbendazole to 
same dog dewormer you use for your dog. So uh, fenbendazole, it can be mixed into the food, 50 milligrams of fenbendazole per kilogram of food given, uh, per kilogram of body weight given. And there's formulas, You uh, there's a lot of formulas on the internet for, you know, making your own food with these medicines in it. And, and the fenbendazole is a dog dewormer you can get at the pet store, uh, things like that, where you can treat, if you think, especially if you see like the camelinus worm hanging directly out of your fish, you'll, you'll know you want to try to do this. And you have to repeat it every two weeks. Uh, I would do two to three treatments at least. And for the crustaceans, these are the anchor worms, the fish lice, or gasless, which is a crustacean that attaches to the gills. Uh, these, in the past, we've treated with trichlorophon, which is an organophosphate. It works pretty well. However, if you overdose trichlorophon, you can affect your fish. It can actually kill the fish. It's also uh, toxic to people. So if you're handling this, you have to wear gloves, maybe wear a respirator mask because it comes as a powder. You mix it with the water, put it in the pond, or put it in your aquarium, but you do have to handle it with care. There might be some liquid formulas available as well. Uh, <clears throat> Lufineuron is a similar type of drug, uh, and diflubenzuron. These are used in dogs, uh, or uh, lufineuron is used in dogs. Diflubenzuron is used in the pest control as an insect growth regulator. And because these crustaceans contain chitin, these chitin and synthesis inhibitors like diflubenzuron, which is dimelin, or uh, lufineuron, these work to prohibit uh, the reproduction of crustaceans. So that's why these are good. And these are much safer than trichlorophon, but they're also more expensive. And the fish should be checked after treatment to ensure the parasites are gone. Retreatment is necessary, especially with these egg-laying ones. So you want to treat them every couple of weeks for multiple doses so that the eggs hatch. And so that's basically the, the kind of parasites that we see that are the metazoan type of parasites, um, what they look like on the fish, how to treat them. Uh, a lot of these treatments are available commercially through your pets more, pets, uh, pet stores or online uh, or through your veterinarian if you have questions. Uh, uh, if you do have a question for veterinarians, I just wanna put in a plug here. The World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association has a website called wavma.org, O-R-G, so wavma.org, and there is a find a fish vet link on the website where you can find a local veterinarian who works with fish who might be able to give you some advice or help as needed. And so that uh, kind of concludes our metazoan parasite talk today. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Nick. Um, I think I definitely learned a lot here and hopefully everyone else who tuned in enjoyed it and learned something also. Uh, so that concludes this week's Ink Talk. Um, as I mentioned, we do this every other week on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. CST normally. We're a little late today, but nonetheless, we wanted to make sure we got this done for you guys. So uh, stay tuned. Um, in a couple of weeks, we'll be back on the same day, 1 p.m. CST on a Wednesday. And uh, we'll be talking more, I think, still about parasites and some other type of... Uh, right. Or are we, yeah, are we moving done. on now? Yeah, we're, we're going to move on to something okay. that's, uh, exciting. Uh, I, I got a couple <laughs> couple topics in mind we can discuss. I Perfect. think people might there get too much parasites. They might get paranoid. Or <laughs> so maybe we'll give them something more pleasant for a little sure. bit and then come back to bacteria and fungus later. <laughs> all good. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thank you, most of all, Dr. Nick, for your time, your expertise, You're and uh, putting this information together. Um, as I mentioned, we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Have a great rest of your week, and um, we'll see you uh, on next Tank Talk. Thanks, Ian. <laughs>